It is so good to see each and every one of you on this fine spring morning. It's still a little chilly, but it's finally warming up. It's a good thing we're talking about vines and branches, as you'll find out in just a moment, because we're starting to see more vines and branches, more greenery springing up after the long winter. Our scripture lesson for today comes from the Gospel according to St. John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. These are the words of Jesus. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes in order to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I've spoken to you. Now abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. And such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Here ends the lesson. May God transform understanding into action. Amen. One of my favorite books about spirituality and the spiritual journeys that we all take is a book called Autobiography of a Yogi. It's a book written by a guy who went by the name Paramahansa Yogananda, which is a bit of a mouthful. The book tells the story of Yogananda as he was called by his friends and family. As he grows up in India in the 1920s and the 1930s, ultimately becomes a, a yogi, a Hindu teacher, and moves to the United States where he introduced yoga to America. Now the yoga he introduced is very different from the yoga that you and I know today, the kind of yoga that you can learn at, say, a YMCA. But they share a lot of common elements. And so it's interesting to go back through Yogananda's own words and hear how he helped to sort of redevelop or repopularize something that has been such a cultural institution in India for so long. But I don't want to talk about yoga this morning. I want to talk about plants. There's a chapter very early on in Autobiography of a Yogi in which Yogananda is talking about his own resistance to personal education. He grew up in a moderately wealthy family, and it was important to them, like it is for many families, that their sons be very, very well educated. And so they paid quite a bit of money to send him to a school, which he promptly dropped out of. He didn't like it, it wasn't to his tastes, and he tended to, at least by his own description, travel the streets of India trying to find gurus teachers, mystics, people he could learn at their feet. That was his formal education. Except for one exception. This guy wasn't a mystic, he wasn't a guru, he wasn't a religious man, he was a scientist, in particular a botanist. And he revolutionized the way we think about plants. So very early on in Autobiography of a Yogi, Yogananda meets a guy by the name of J.C. Bose. Have you heard this name? Has anyone here heard this name? I think Shannon stepped out. I'm wondering if she's heard this name. Bose, I, I'd never heard of him either. Bose actually revolutionized how we think about plants. The kind of stuff that people used to think was a bunch of hibbity-jibbity, he actually could demonstrate under a microscope. He could show certain things about plants that we now know to be true that back in the day we kind of thought was a bit ridiculous. For instance, Using a device that Bose invented called a crescograph, he was able to essentially demonstrate that plant fibers work in much the same way that human tissue works. 
Their cells respond to each other in the same way or in a similar way that human tissues respond to one another. So if you were to essentially put a plant, a living plant, underneath this cressograph and you were to stimulate it in some way, say adding some chemicals into the mixture or poking it even, you could actually see the cells recoil and retract. Plants are, after all, living things. And we're just really, even now, beginning to understand the depth of how their experience can in some ways match our own. Now, I don't know if that deeper connection has anything to do with why Jesus chose plants as his metaphor. I think it probably had more to do with the fact that he lived in an agrarian society. All the money was in what you could produce out of the ground, and so it makes sense that as he's talking to men and women in a culture that knew agriculture really well, that he would start by describing something they knew, in the same way that he used the fishing metaphor with the fishermen. So he chooses, for whatever reason, to use plants as the metaphor. And I have to admit, I haven't always known a lot about plants. I still don't know a ton. Part of the influence in my growing interest in plant life has to do with wanting to eat a little healthier, maybe a more plant-based diet. It also has to do with my wife, Lindsay, who works in sustainability, and this is something that really matters to her. Back when we first started dating and I was still trying to impress her, um, well, <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. So. <laughs> Back when we were still dating and I was still trying to impress her, I would buy her plants, which if she ever took a trip would promptly die once I got my hands on them because I would try to take care of them while she was away and I never seemed to do it right. Too much water, not enough water. Too much sunlight, not the right kind of sunlight. I can never seem to keep track of, all, and she had so many. So there were all of these different rules for all of these different plants and I would write everything down and I would still mess it up. So over time, and in particular through her patience, I've gotten a little more comfortable and a little more familiar with plants, and they're kind of fascinating. So I wanna have a little fun with this passage this morning, not necessarily to, to say definitively whether or not Jesus had this in mind when he said these words, but I think there are some interesting parallels between our own experience and the things Jesus talks about in this passage today. As a congregation, we're talking about stewardship. So there's already an obvious connection. A gardener tends to his or her garden, wants to be a good steward of his or her garden, puts in the requisite time and energy, follows a certain set of instructions in order to hopefully be a good steward of whatever it is you're growing, whether it's food or just plants for the beauty of it, whatever it is, it takes an effort. Anyone who's ever worked on a farm can speak to that. It takes effort to preserve plant life. But when you do, it's gorgeous, right? Likewise, as we are stewards of our church, as we are stewards of our resources, it takes effort. It takes a lot of different perspectives. It takes lots of different instructions for different scenarios and situations so that we can maximize the resources we have to be a people with a progressive voice and working hands in Lowell, Michigan. But here's the thing about stewardship, and here's the thing about tending your own garden. The problem with stewardship, as we often commonly define it, is that it only has to do with the resources you bring to a particular nonprofit, like a church. That word steward is usually only thrown around in church settings. It's part of the Christianese that we all pick up over the years, the language of our faith, the shorthands that we take in describing things. So we say, be a good steward. What we really mean is give. We say, be a good steward. What we really mean is volunteer. But stewardship, particularly as Jesus defines it, is not limited to the work we do in this space. It's not even limited to the work we do for this space. When Jesus called his disciples to abandon everything they knew and to follow him, it was a little crazy. It didn't quite make sense. Give up our homes, our families. At one point, Jesus seems to be particularly cruel and he says, let the dead bury their own dead. Come and follow me. What is he talking about? Give up everything we've known? That's not easy. 
But the first thing you'll notice is that Jesus is not interested in segregating our holy life from everything else. Following Jesus becomes, for his disciples in the text, an all or nothing proposition. So when we talk about stewardship, if we're only limiting the work that we do as disciples in this particular place, it's important, but frankly, it's not the only important thing. And as far as your own health and well-being, your own fruitfulness, as you will, it might not actually be the most important thing. Taking care of yourself might come first before you take, part, take care of a community. You need to know what you're capable of. You need to know what your limitations are. You need to not burn out. This is something we tell people, particularly in nonprofits, all the time. Right? Don't burn out. Take care of yourself. Take some time. Take a breather. I know next week I'm taking some much needed rest. It'll be really nice to kind of reflect on the things we've done so far, take a couple of days, and then back into the fray. It's important. So stewardship is not just about what you can do for us, it's about what you do for yourself so that you can keep being fruitful. It extends to everything. So what can we learn from plants? Well, the first thing that's interesting about plants is that for the most part, even though they do move, like I mentioned before, they can recoil, they can react, they can grow, they get bigger, we see them expand over time. If you've ever watched one of those time-lapse videos that shows a plant growing, over a shortened period of time. It's pretty fascinating to watch the thing just kind of climb and climb. You really get a sense of how alive it is. And yet, that's actually a really slow and gradual process. But the plant, presuming it starts off in a decent place, a decent spot of soil, a decent patch of earth, access to sun and some water, for the most part, a plant does everything it needs without going a long distance. So the first thing I think that's worth, worth noting when we think about how can I bear fruit is that you don't necessarily need to go anywhere other than where you are. I've met people, and I've been, I say I've met people, I've been people who went through a period of time where I realized I just need a change. I just need to clear my head and get out of this space. And so I moved. I moved from Georgia to Michigan. I moved from Michigan to Philadelphia for school. Philadelphia to West Palm Beach. West Palm Beach back to Michigan. It has a gravity. It pulls you back in. It does. It really does. And so the funny thing is, as much as I see the value in sometimes starting over or being in a new place, having a fresh start, it isn't absolutely necessary for growth and development in every situation. And we can sometimes make the mistake that the thing that keeps us from growing, the reason we feel like we're stagnating, is because of everything around us. If I just changed everything about everyone around me, <laughs> if I could just teach those guys on the highway how to drive, <laughs> then everything will be fine. I will have everything I need, all the nutrients I need to grow and grow and grow and bear much fruit. But plants don't do that. In fact, they don't get much of a choice. If a plant does move, and we'll talk about what the consequences of that are, if a plant does move, it's usually accidental. It's not like someone asks the plant, do you want to be repotted? The plant usually doesn't have much choice. So one of the things we can learn is that where you are is a good enough place to start. It may not be perfect, it may not be the place we want, but if you want to bear fruit, you can start bearing fruit where you are. What do I mean by bearing fruit? This is all Bible talk, right? Be a good steward, bear much fruit. This is not generally how we talk about things when we're sitting in the office or when we're at the dinner table talking to our spouse or when we're trying to get our kids to bed in time. We don't use this kind of language in our everyday lives. It needs a little translating because after a while it gets old. We're used to hearing it, it stops meaning anything. What does it mean to bear fruit? Anything you do, anything you are, anything you say and the choices you make is a way in which you bear fruit. That is the product, the sum total of everything that you are in that moment, in that place. So when we pull out the old cliche of sometimes just holding a door open makes a difference, sometimes a smile just makes a difference, it kind of does. 
Because everywhere you are is an opportunity, a context, soil that you're planted in to bear fruit. And whatever you do with that context is entirely up to you for their benefit and for yours. You don't have to go anywhere. The second thing, and the reason I brought up the Kreska graph earlier, is not only does a particular piece of a plant respond when it's exposed to stimuli, but plants can, in their own strange little way, communicate with each other. In the same way that a neural network in our minds allows us to carry, preserve, and interpret information in our brains. The thing that makes it easier for you to make decisions, if it's easy for you to make decisions, that is, it's all up here, right? And so plants do much the same thing. There are networks of plants growing in proximity to each other. And they benefit from the growth. The growth doesn't stemmy them. The growth doesn't stagnate them. It's actually a really, really good thing. Some of the most fertile places on our planet are places with tons of plants and animal life in extreme proximity to one another. Think of the rainforests, which we're fighting so hard to preserve, right? Last week was Earth Sunday or Earth Day, right? If we're thinking a little bit about our contribution and our impact on nature, one of the things we're fighting to preserve right now is this place where nature and life are allowed to sort of grow unbounded, and we don't want to lose that because we don't fully understand the consequences that will affect us later. So plants, too, have a network. And though we describe ourselves as human beings as a little bit higher up on the food chain than plants, in fact, many of us enjoy eating plants, some of us only eat plants, despite the fact that we're a little higher up on the food chain, we haven't actually developed enough to be totally self-sufficient. We need one another. So networks become super important. The way in which you are connected to other people helps keep you sane. It helps keep you healthy. It helps support you in good times and bad. Right, this is again the cliche of you need a church family to be with you whenever bad times come or someone to celebrate with you when good times come. It's a cliche, but it's true. That interconnectedness, that web of connections that I talk about every week, that's real. And you participate in it every time you walk in this building. But not just in this building. You participate in your, in your professional associations your friendships, things that have nothing to do with this community or any organization you belong to, we are connected. And the more we begin to see our actions as having impact on other people's experiences, the more we respect the power and the danger of that connection, the more we bear positive fruit, the more we avoid trouble, the more we avoid mix-ups, the more we avoid hurting those who are vulnerable because suddenly we see that our actions have consequences. So that's another thing to learn from plants. Jesus kind of knew what he was talking about. I am the vine and you are the branches. Here's the weird thing though about this passage, and this is not, it's sermon talk, but it's real talk for a minute. This passage gets used so much when talking about the afterlife. You, you, I'm assuming you can see why, right? You know, if, if you don't bear fruit, you get cut down and thrown into the fire. And then someone somewhere said, hey, I like the sound of that. Cut down and thrown into the fire. I can use that. And suddenly, we're manipulating people into doing what we want because we're misreading the passage. What else can we learn from plants? Plants that don't grow stagnate. And plants that stagnate die. That brown thumb that I have that always seems to kill my wife's favorite plants unintentionally, right? It's not because I'm a plant assassin, although I might be. It's actually because plants have a certain set of conditions they need to thrive. And they're not super picky. They're not as picky as you and I can be. But they need certain basic conditions. And if they can't grow, have you ever had a, 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 a plant in a pot that became too small? Eventually it starts to hurt the plant. If you don't grow and you don't change, if you don't embrace the willingness to do that, it can have fatal consequences. And if not fatal consequences, then certainly dire consequences. We grow. We need to grow. We need to change. We need to be open to the 
to the fact that that's a fundamental truth for us. That no matter how much we might want to take this particular moment in our lives and bottle it up and preserve it and keep it for all time, that's not how life is supposed to work, and it's probably a bad idea. We need to be willing to change. Something else to learn from, plant, from plants. But here's the one that gets me. So you can take a plant, for example, a plant that's outgrown its pot. And you can move it around and put it in a new environment. You can take it outside and expose it to sunlight. You can give it some basic conditions suitable to growth. And despite the trauma of being uprooted and experiencing great change, the plant actually will thrive. The plant doesn't have any say in the matter. It just sort of happens, right? There are lots of things in life that work that way. I wasn't expecting to get sick. I wasn't expecting to get that phone call this afternoon that completely changes my plans for the week. I wasn't expecting to have to deal with that particular crisis today. And yet, if there's anything we can learn from plants, it's that they are surprisingly resilient. We too, despite our own self-doubts, can be surprisingly resilient. We can endure some extraordinary things. There are so many stories, generational stories, of folks who have survived wars, who have survived political and social upheavals, who have survived entire nation states, whose homes no longer exist in any way comparable to what they did in their nostalgic mind's eye. And yet, despite the trauma of being uprooted, despite the trauma of unwanted change or unasked for change, they endure. And I think part of the reason why they're able to endure is because of those networks. The willingness to change, the willingness to allow ourselves to be in a different situation and see how it goes, but also the ability to draw on the strength of others in our network. These are all parts of what it means to be the branches of the vine, to be good stewards of the garden. This is not about eternal punishment. This is not about eternal, it's not even about eternal reward. It's just about the recognition that there are certain things we need to survive and maybe we could learn something from those in the plant family. But here's the funny thing. The Christian story really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I'm not talking about the resurrection. I'm not talking about miracles. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm talking about the love thing. We live in a world and, and plants in particular inhabit this world, of power structures. We live in a world where power is bought and sold and leveraged, and we use power in different ways to get what we want, or we've experienced, we've been on the receiving end of someone's power trip, using power to get what they want, and we got caught up in the crosshair somehow, maybe unintentionally, right? And yet Christ says, love them anyway. Ultimately, that's what it means to be a good steward. Despite the trauma, despite the awareness that something has happened to you or something could happen to you, the fact of the unpredictability of life, don't let it bog you down. That's crazy talk. If I have power, why shouldn't I just take it? If I have an opportunity to look out for myself and only myself, why shouldn't I just grasp it? But Jesus says, do the opposite. You want to be a good steward of the world that you're given. Do the thing that doesn't make any sense. Self-sacrifice doesn't make any sense. It's not in our impulse. No matter how much we talk about altruism and no matter how much we talk about selflessness, we all have a little bit of, you know, looking out for me and my own. It's kind of inherent to us. It's a survival mechanism. It's a good thing, by the way. It's nothing to be shamed over. And yet Jesus says when that impulse gets a little too strong for your tastes, or when you feel as if all you want to do is drive over everyone in your way with that bus and just toss them under. Don't do it. This is the fruit we bear. It's crazy talk. 
It's the fruit of the loons, right? This is the pun. This is the thing that we are given, the thing that has been preserved for 2,000 years, the thing that makes that network, that plant-like network, sustainable is our willingness to give up something for the benefit of someone else in the network. It's our willingness to share a little bit. That sometimes being a good steward of your resources is sharing them so that you don't have as many resources as you used to, but now someone else in your network also has those resources. Now, in order for that to work, there needs to be accountability. We need to make sure that power isn't being consolidated or abused, and I get that. But just this idea, this fundamental, crazy idea that in a world where everything is about power, we can just give all that up and love. What a gift. So as we move on into Stewardship Sunday, as we get closer, rather, to Stewardship Sunday, to Consecration Sunday, as we start thinking about ways that we might contribute in this space, I just encourage you, don't limit it to this space. Let this season of stewardship kind of be like Lent or Advent for you. Let it be a time of reflection. How can you be a good steward of yourself? How can you bear more fruit? And once you realize what you need in order to do that, whether something in your life needs to be pruned or trimmed back, whatever that might be, bear that fruit. Even if it is the fruit of the loons, bear that fruit and grow, grow, grow. Amen.